we as visionaries have been given a divine gift. You know, whether you be a poet, a photographer, a painter, a writer, we need all hands on deck right now to, as visionaries, to make the world a better place. Jamel Shabazz. Jamel Shabazz. Jamil Shabazz is a New York born photographer. It's Brooklyn, baby. Come on, it's Brooklyn. Who has inspired a generation of street photographers, of young black photographers to going out and seeing the world in a new way. I have goosebumps. I've been waiting for this moment for an incredibly long time. Guys, I present to you. No one was able to get shots like that back in the day. It was like a visual diary of my life. When you look at those pictures, you look at seconds of my life. That's the shot. Then you go to old school. This is hip hop. And Jamel Shabazz. Jamil Shabazz. Let's go. Jamil Shabazz is in the house. Let's go. I'm so, I'm so, so happy to have you as a guest. Thank you so much for taking the time to be Let's on go. Behind go. the Picture, man. How are you today? I'm doing great. You know, I have no complaints and I love feeling wonderful today. This is a joy to reconnect with you after all of these years. This is Jamal Shabazz. The reason that we all carry cameras downtown. The reason we're all taking pictures in the street. Brother, so it's truly an honor and a privilege to be in front of you today. I appreciate that so much, Jamil. The first question that I have for you, how did photography find you? Came to me by way of my father, who was a professional photographer, and he absolutely loved the craft. When we lived in Brooklyn in the 1960s, he, he had converted our small apartment into a studio, and he would photograph us as, as, as kids, you know, my sister and my siblings, and he would photograph the neighbors. So early on in my life, I would watch my father set up the lights in our living room and convert our living room into a studio. So I didn't understand what was going on at that time, but I knew he was a photographer. And as time progressed, I started looking at the family photo albums that he treasured. My father took great pride in holding on to the albums that were passed on to him from generation to generation. So those albums sat very prominent on our coffee table. So as a young child, you know, I would go through these albums and see images of my father when he was younger, my mother, and just the family. So I knew early on that there was power in photography and the documentation of, of, of family history to pass on from generation to generation. So at that age, I was introduced to it. And then my father had a vast library of photography books. So as a young child, about five, six years old, I started going through his library and seeing the world. It's like my whole world opened up as a young child. Unbeknownst to my father, I'm looking at all of his photography books. The first one that I was introduced to that really blew my mind was a book called Black and White America by Leonard Freed. What made this particular book unique, it was signed on our tape. And this is about 1968. I'm seven, eight years old, and I'm looking at this book here, and whatever reason, it's tailor-made for me because it's speaking about being Black in America at that time. And I, I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't being taught this in school. That one book informed me, not only photographically, but you know, I, I would have the dictionary as a young child dissecting words that I didn't understand. And so it came to me when I was still really in my in my single digits. And I watched my father. He carried his camera everywhere he went. When he would go in to shoot and return, he would lay out all his equipment and clean it. And I studied it. And I didn't understand it until years later. It wasn't until maybe when I was 15 that I really understood what my father did. But, you know, as a young child, I just remember the, the family and friends always telling my father, you always got your camera with you because he learned in the Navy. You know, he's six years in the United States Navy where he was trained in some of the best, one of the best schools in the world, the, the United States Naval School of Photography. And, and he would travel throughout the Mediterranean as a 17 year old kid back in 1955, you know, so that's pretty much where my interest in photography came. When did you realize that you had a talent for photography? It came really early on, to be honest with you. And I often speak about the influence that a noted gang member had in my neighborhood back in 1975. I had a really close friend, Winston, that took me to his cousin's home who belonged to a gang called the Jolly Stompers. And what I found fascinating about going there was he had these large photo albums of the gang. He was an unofficial photographer for the gang. These portraits are some of the most incredible images I've ever seen in my entire life. 
what he documented was a gang called the Jolly Stoppers, and they were a combination between African American and Caribbean youth, and they had a very unique rude boy style. And these were the older guys. So when I saw these albums of these Alpha Brothers back in the days, I immediately said I wanted to be a photographer, despite the fact that I had already saw work that my father documented. And through looking at the various publications such as National Geographic, Life Magazine, Ebony, these particular older rats grabbed me because these were older guys in my neighborhood and they were dressed very dapper. So after leaving Cornell's home, I immediately returned back to my house. And my mother was a, a novice photographer. She had a lot of Kodak Informatic cameras laying around the house. The 110, the 126 always had film in it that she would photograph, you know, different parties. So I snatched those cameras up immediately. I had the vision because I had already been looking at photographs for years earlier. So I knew how to frame a shot and I knew how to actually take an image and be in steady. So I immediately returned back to my junior high school and I started photographing my friends with the leftover film that was in the camera. And back in those days, you took the film to the local drugstore. And when I did, I was blown away to see that these images came out well. It was just point and shoot. But nevertheless, the composition and the subject matter was strong. And at that point, I decided I wanted to be a photographer. And I immediately transformed from being a graffiti artist to embracing photography. And I started carrying the camera to school every day. And my friends would, would chip in and help me buy film, and help me get the film out. And once the film came out, I would give them out as gifts. And now I became known as what? As a photographer early on at 15 years old. And I kept that up for a couple of years. And then my parents divorced and I didn't have money anymore. So I went in the military, but I still have those photographs right now. And they mean the world to me because it shows my early beginning, trying to mirror the photograph that Cornell had as a jolly star. Talk to me about now that you've been established. Yes, this is what my calling is. How did you start? Did you just go out and start making photographs? Who guided you as far as being an actual photographer? That's a great question. It really started when I came home from the army in the summer of 1980. I was stationed in Germany for three years. And during my time over there, I brought my photographs that I had made earlier with me. And they always served as a reminder of my friends and where I came from. So I vowed when I was in Germany, that when I returned back to the States, I will never be without memory again. So I had purchased a Canon AE-1 when I was in Germany and I came home and I was living with my father. And this was great. And he was so excited that I now I'm in, into photography with a, having a 35 millimeter. Prior I had the, the Instamatic. Mm -hmm. So my father took me under the screen and he started to teach me the science of photography. Prior, it was just point and shoot. Now he, he, he introduced me to his library and he instructed me to revisit Black and White America by Leonard Free, understand composition and light. He also instructed me to read the whole series of the Time Life series on photography, to understand themes, composition, light, speed, journalism, war photography. And I went through all of that. Then a, a friend of mine who, who decided to change his, to a, who was a photographer himself, decided to go into the drug trade he gave me his Omega Enlarger. And when I bought that Enlarger home, my father helped me establish a dark room in our laundry room. And he's really excited now that his son has this vision to want to follow in his footsteps. So my father set up the dark room. He instructed me, he, you know, we went and got paper and the chemicals. He told me about the importance of getting Tri-X 400 film. To document your room first. And I found that to be boring. Light and composition. Yeah. He wanted me to start with that first to do okay. still photography because I came home with a lot of stereo albums and books and I found that to be boring. Then he said, I want you to document the block. Just walk around and photograph what you see. And I found that to be a little boring, but I did it and I'm glad I did. But what moved me, being I just came home from the military, was my friends. And I ended up going back to my local high school and I trained my lens there because there was a lot going on during that time. I wanted to reconnect. The camera now gave me a voice. It's one thing to approach people with and greet them, but now I have a camera. Brothers are wearing gazelles and sheepskins, and they were, re this is a really stylish generation. So now I'm eager to document the local high school. I had about six months off from the military, you know, you know, came home to a new decade because I left in the 70s and now I'm coming home in 1980 and so much has changed. 
you know, it's a very vibrant community right now and everyone is stylish. So my high school was about maybe five blocks from my house. So I took my camera. My father said, always walk with your camera, have it out and at the ready. Keep with the 400 film, keep it at about 5.6 at 125th of a second. So he drilled me on that and always have your camera out ready. No cap, he was, was one that didn't believe in ca having caps on the camera. So always be ready. So I went back to my high school. A lot of the guys and girls that were going to high school, I knew their older brothers and sisters who I went to school with. So I went back and I started communicating with them. It reminds me so much of Marvin Gaye's song, What's Happening, Brother. I returned back to the scene and I want to know what's going on. And now I want to have the vision diary everybody I met in my life. Because when I was in the army, I promised myself I would have a visual diary of everyone I met. So now I'm photographing kids and I'm using it. First of all, before I even photograph them, I'm engaged in conversation because I want to know what's going on. The photograph came evidence of the conversation. And at the same time, I use this position to speak to young kids about the importance of education, the importance of having goals and objectives. I said, I just got back to, to America. And I made a change in my life because when I went to high school, I kind of like went astray. So I used my position to be a mentor to young people. And in taking and making an image of them, it helped to create a bond because I would make the image. My father wanted contact sheets. So once I, I got the film process, I would get the contact sheets, go back. We would look at them. He would make corrections. I would make prints, five by seven prints, and eight by 10 prints, go back to the high school and get them out as gifts. And then the word started to spread. I didn't want anything in return. So I would give out prints and then it helped to build the relationship. And with these prints, I started to, to, to put them in portfolios and start traveling throughout Brooklyn with work now, you know, engaging a lot of young people saying, look, because I came home to a war zone too. It's very important for me to say that. I returned back to a city that was at war. A lot of young men that were once friends and with each other, whatever reason, something happened during my time away. There's a lot of conflict going on. So I want to know what's going on. So traveling throughout the, the neighborhood of Brooklyn, engaging young people, trying to get a feel of what's going on, photographing all of these young brothers and engaging in conversation, not knowing that a lot of them were enemies to one another. But as a photographer, I became like a mentor to them and I was given a relationship unbeknownst to me, they were arch enemies to one another. So I was paying behind it. So my mission shifted a little bit from just wanting to be a photographer to now wanting to be a mentor and to engage young people about the senseless violence by introducing to all the things I learned in the military. I came home with a, a vast record collection. So a lot of these young guys I would bring into my home where I would turn them on to the jazz and the RB and the reggae. I started teaching brothers how to play chess and sisters because it was a form of conflict resolution. So in some of my earlier photographs, you see me with my camera around my neck and my chessboard in my hand and my camera bag. That was my standard equipment and my portfolio. And I used that to build relationships with a lot of people. And I started with the local high schools. I went to one high school, Sandy J. Tillman, and my neighbor, the one I went to, and I branched out to another high school where I didn't really know nobody yet, but I used that opportunity to just introduce myself, show them the pictures I had, drew people in, and I started to photograph. And each time I photograph young people, I will return back and get them copies. You know, as time progressed, I started shooting more color. And I would go to the one out of the one out of the photo lab. And I would go in the areas that were highly populated, like downtown Brooklyn. And I would take make images, return, give them, give them out, keep a copy for myself, and build these relationships. It was always about building a relationship. And I wanted them to see what I wanted to do. That's why I carry the work with me. That's why my new book. It's based on my photo album because I always carried around a photo album. There's one thing for you to hear what I'm saying, but now I'm showing photographs of other young people and that was the draw. I love it. I love it. Are you using that same theory today? Do you carry photographs? Do you use your phone to share your work? I remember the first time I met you and I want to touch on that in a minute, but do you remember the first time you made money with your camera? Yeah, I really didn't want any money, believe it or not. I used to tell a lot of the young people, because, you know, they were young, they didn't really have a lot. It's like, yo, get me a quarter Tropicana orange just a pound of bananas. So I got the pound of bananas, and I'm breaking bread with young people. We got the orange juice going around. I didn't really want money at that point. How were you making money at that time? That's, I think, the question that many of my viewers may have. I know you worked in a correctional facility. Was that your job while you were making these photographs? For the first years when I came off the military, I was pretty much independent. I saved up enough money in the service where I was able to live off that. So that allowed me to survive. So photography was never really a business for me. It was just a way of life.
life. In 1983, I became a correctional officer because I needed that foundation right now. And they had a 20 year pension and it allowed me an opportunity to really take my craft to the next level. That was my new assignment. I needed to be into the jail. So I looked at it as a guard's assignment that was given to me because a lot of young men were fallen victims of the system. So now I have a, I have a good paying job that now allows me to devote a lot of my time and energy towards my photography. So that's very important to have a concrete day job. And that's where I started photographing my co-workers for money because that's, you know, because now they're in uniform and that was a great source of income. And I didn't really need that at that point, but I just felt that it's good to understand the business and not just do these eight by tens and give them away for free. But my co-workers is making money. So I started to charge $10 for an eight by 10 not sign, just passing them. Of course, a lot of, for, for many of my coworkers, they were taking photographs in the uniform for the first time. I took my room where we changed that into a studio using the locker as a backdrop. You know, wow. even when I was in the community, I was photographing, you know, for pretty much $10. Because back then you get a roll of film process, you get a free eight by 10. So the free eight by 10, I'll charge $10 and get me a few rolls of film. That was pretty much my business throughout much of the eighties and early nineties. What about the first time you ever saw your work published in a magazine? How do you go from that person who is walking down the street with their camera to somebody who is at this point a household name? How did you make that transition? Oh man, that was an incredible experience. During the 1990s, you know, when the crack epidemic hit, a lot of people were losing their lives and, and they lost their way. You know, people fell victim to using drugs or selling drugs. And now I have this incredible body of work, as I like to refer to as a time before crack. So I'm now working in, in, in Manhattan and I'm looking at magazines like Source, Trace, and Vibe magazine. And I'm looking at these beautiful pictures, youth culture, and I felt there was a void there. So I gathered up my portfolios and I went to the Source magazine with no appointment. I just had a portfolio full of eight by 10 prints and I happened to just go there. You know, you know, I looked at the magazine, found the location and I went. I didn't know nobody at all. And I, it was the strangest thing because I'm in the elevator and, I, and there's this brother in the elevator, Eric Russ. And he says to me, what you got? Bro, I got a portfolio of images. I want to bring them to Source. I think that this publication can appreciate. This is 1999. He said, let me, let me see what you, and he looks at this, this portfolio about 20 five images of street porches from Brooklyn. The pictures that will make up my book back in the day. He says, this is what we're looking for for our 100 issue. He says, we want to use all of these pictures for our 100 issue. And I was blown away behind this here. And, and he, he took the phone away the other day. When 2000 came, they gave me about 15 pages in the Source the Magazine, bro. And I was blown away. When that issue came out, they said that it sold out in almost two days. People went crazy for it because I had, unlike the magazine, which is focused on stars, street stars, brothers Real and people. sisters from Brooklyn, who were real people who were terrible. And they, no one had ever seen that before. And the magazine, they said, sold out in a, in a matter of days. People were being for this issue of regular people. And that's when it blew up. And at that point, uh, I knew, I realized I had something. And then I started going to other magazines. I went to Trace Magazine and they did a feature. And with Trace Magazine under Clark Rinsky, it provided me with exhibition opportunities. Now I went from just publishing to now I have institutions in France wanting to showcase my work. So from, from now going to Trace Magazine, before I knew it, I'm doing an exhibition in Paris for the very first time. Based off these same images, I didn't realize I had something. And I'm trying to now understand how do you navigate through just publishing to now exhibiting work in that type of manner. It was all new to me, brother. I had nobody to really guide me at that point. I'm trying to figure this thing out now because it all came fast. But not only did the exhibition opportunities come, now, you know, the next step was to go to the publisher. So in 2000, the Source magazine came out. And then in 2000, matter of fact, later on that year, I, I, I saw a book that Powerhouse published. I forgot the name, but it escapes me right now. So I decided to go to Powerhouse. So I mm. went to Powerhouse with, with a portfolio of laser copy prints. And they looked at the work and they said, this is what we've been looking for. They said, we're going to publish your book. If you if you open, your book will be out next year. A year later, September of 2001, my book back in the days came out. And that was based off dismantling photo albums. No Photoshop. I just took apart. When you look at the book back in the days, those are actual four by six prints. Prince taken out of a series of photo albums, converted it into a book. To me, they were never really my best work, but I let Powerhouse make that decision. And when that book came out in 2001, it, the first edition sold out in two months and the second edition sold out in two weeks. And it became a blockbuster. And I was I was shocked behind it. And that was in, I believe it's in the 11th edition. I still can't believe it. Of course, I've always felt it wasn't my best work, but I'm thankful for Fab Five Freddy for writing that incredible introduction 
to kind of like help give it even greater wings. You know, so that's for you know, starting from the publishing industry to, you know, taking a shot at a book. I I never wrote a proposal. I just said, let me just go to the publisher. I went against the grain because normally you have to write a proposal and all that. I went directly to Powerhouse at a good time because they had pretty much just got established. So they was a new small mom and pops operation. So I caught them at a good time. Now I was able to give them a blockbuster to my surprise. That's an incredible, incredible story. We're now in and around 90 which the timelines align 2000 2001 and I'm shooting streetwear I'm shooting fashion more street fashion because hip-hop is really breaking and I'm starting to shoot big rappers like Pharrell and Kanye West and I'm starting to travel and I'm going to New York for the first time I met George Pitts the late George Pitts from Vibe magazine who I'm sure you know and miss in 96 that was my first time in New York and he introduced me two photographers like you that were he said at that time you're good enough to shoot for vibe magazine but there's also some other photographers that were good enough so he photocopied my portfolio and then he put my portfolio on the bottom of a stack that was mm. if i'm sitting it's up here of it. photocopies i'm sure you remember george pitts's office right <laughs> so he took my portfolio and stuffed it in the bottom of photocopies that were as high as the room and then he said this Jamil he said let me show you a photographer that I'm gonna publish that came in and saw me before you and he pulled photocopies of photographs and those photographs were Jamil Shabazz and wow. that understand that George Pitts showed me Jamil Shabazz he showed me Robert Maxwell and he showed me Christian Witkin which is Joel Peter Witkin's son and looking at your photographs advertising agencies started to like steal your style steal your essence and hire other yeah. photographers to shoot like you for their campaigns and i just remember that time you were more famous and more talented and people were taking advantage of your work your style your influence and they weren't paying it back forward to the person who was the originator. So talk to me about that. That's a really great observation there, Steve. Of course, it took me like many years. I think I'm just starting to get work for companies now, but throughout much of the 2000s, you know, nobody really hired me, you know, at, at that point, you know, not for campaigns or anything, you know, even with Vibe Magazine, I could do features, but I was never given any real opportunities to shoot any, any of the other celebs. And I was all right with that because, you know, my focus is really the street. But what I start to look at what I want to do at that point was all right fine i started going to a lot of galleries and i i saw that my work belonged in museums and institutions of higher learning but that's where i wanted to be you know i wasn't really impressed with the magazine at that point they served their purpose you know they featured my work and that was great it helped me develop a fan base but whatever reason i realized that they were roadblocks that were put in my path and i wasn't going to get those jobs because i didn't look at people who started out after me that were getting those positions and i realized that there was something that was there i didn't quite know what it was and i didn't take it personal but i continued to drop to, to drive on because I knew that one day this work would mean something to somebody. And I and I persevered and I did not let anything deter me whatsoever. And I created a vast body of work where it just wasn't rooted in my traditional style of opposed images, but I was doing fashion, my own fashion. Being that magazines weren't hiring me, I would meet people at Starbucks, young brothers and sisters that had aspirations or I saw talent. I said, yo, check this out. I like your vibe, you know? And I, I used to design clothes and, and collect clothes. So I would style a lot of young people, give them eyes to show. So a lot of the work that I have in exhibitions right now in, in publications are a lot of the young brothers and sisters I met early on who just worked in, in stores who were at a crossroad with their lives and I would style and photograph them and create my own style. I will find locations and photograph them and create a really unique body work and give them the photographs for free because I knew that there weren't, weren't going to be any doors open to me. And all of those photographs now that I've made during that time period of everyday people who I styled on my own day in major publications right now, like the Hip Hop Jewelry Book, uh, the the new book on Flip, Fresh Fly and Fabulous. I make it a point to some images of those people I photographed some 10, 20 years ago who maybe didn't get their shine in, but they get it now. But I'll say during the past maybe eight years, uh, I'll, I'll say maybe 10 years, a lot of companies have, are now reaching out, especially with the birth of the back the anniversaries of hip hop over time from the 20th, the 30th, the 40th, the 50th, people are now reaching out to me. So I've been now fortunate to have done work with Puma, Pro Kids, and Pony, but it took a while to get to that particular point. 
we have to look at the masters for inspiration. And for me, that's why I started this interview series. You were on, the first on my list as people I wanted to interview. You've always mentored the next generation of photographers. And I just want to touch a little bit about how I met you. Che said, I brought someone to meet you. You said the kindest words that I think any other photographer that I respect so much has ever said. And we had some time together and you said this, you are a master. You need a book. How come you're not publishing? And it was because of brother Jamil Shabazz. I, the next year, dropped my first coffee table book, which is called Positives, which is the year that we exhibited together. And we did three generations of hip hop. That started something for me. I want to tell you the compliments that you gave to me that day. And you also, you had a print that you wanted to give me, but then you didn't want to give me because you wanted to give me another one. Can we talk a little bit about three generations of hip hop? To the truest show. Deep Cardi. Jamal Shabazz. Jamal Shabazz. Steve Cardi. Jamal Shabazz. Steve Cardi. Jamal Shabazz. Steve Cardi. Jamal Shabazz. Cardi. Che Kathari. Talk to him. It's like every single night thinking of a single to write. Jamal Shabazz. And, and that show and you bringing your work to Toronto. My name is Che Kathari. I'm here exhibiting photography at the Jerome Jenner Smash Gallery. My name is Cardi. Steve Cardi, photographer from Toronto. My name is Jamal Shabazz. I'm from New York. Us doing workshops here, us doing a walk and talk together, mentoring the kids that came out that were supporting the show. For me, seeing how you do that, seeing how you are as a teacher, anytime you have a camera in your hand, anytime you see someone with a camera, you're sharing information, you're sharing knowledge, you're sharing wisdom, you're inspiring, you're always about uplifting. I stole that from you way back then and I've been doing my best. I started doing workshops. I want you to know I started doing workshops right around that time of our first three generations of hip hop and I haven't stopped with that paying it forward and I want to let you know you really started something for me that day so I got to give you some love thank you so much for sharing but I got to give a shout out to all of my people in Toronto you know my man Dr. Kid of Montague uh, yes, who of gave course. me a wonderful book during the contact eye festival which really put my work on the map in a major way because you have these incredible images now of the New York subway system instead of on the trains in Toronto. And that was incredible for me because I never had that type of experience before. And that allowed me, that exhibition itself at, at his gallery, you know, allowed me to really meet so many incredible people. And I have to say, I've traveled to a number of cities around the world. Toronto is the number one city that's close to my heart. I have never met so many incredible people in my life under the umbrella of the art in there. You know, so, that, you know, I just, I just had to just share that. So many amazing people. And uh, to me, you and Shay was incredible and, and Jelani and Ajani and so many many amazing, wonderful, young, humble photographers. We have to use our talent. Whether you're a photographer, you're an artist, you're a poet, you're a teacher, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're an uncle. Let's use this internal gift to bring about change. It gave me a higher purpose in life because really, to be honest with you, I wasn't doing workshops before I came to Toronto. Toronto was really that place. I got a chance to exhibit and communicate with people. Prior to coming, I had a gallery in New York and it was a very cold gallery. You know, it was, it was stuffy, no music no vibe. It was just a certain vibration that worked me. When I came to Toronto, it was a certain type of energy that yeah. was there, that was there that we love. I love the diversity of the of the people. It was just a spirit to say, this is my home. Even to the point where I want to live in Toronto. Of course, the <laughs> vibration yeah. was an energy that I just so exhibited for the each time just allowed me to meet so many amazing people. Unlike being in New York where I knew a lot of people, I'm developing new friendships that I have to this very day. 
works. The three generations was a great because it allowed me to learn more about your work, Jay's work, meet a larger body of people, of, of art, mainly the art community. And with that came the workshops in Regent Park, you know, and this is all new. And I, at first it was very uncomfortable because I felt I'm an outsider and I don't belong. Let me mm. come if anything. Third, but I felt this is your community for you guys to document. But as time progressed, I, I took on the challenge and I went on to document Regent Park and other communities and mentoring people means the world of me because I feel that the art community has the power to make this world a better place. It's beyond photography. It's having young people in front of you and engaging them in conversations, speak about goals and as aspirations. Because I saw Toronto and me was the promised land. So I needed all here to help me navigate this and get around, bring about this unity. I felt that Toronto could be the, the, the city that could serve as, as, as a roadmap to how we can be. Of course, oh, all the came together from the different cultural backgrounds. So I have to say those days spent in Toronto was some of the greatest days of my life. Oh, Unlike man, that means everything. And I've been to a number of foreign countries, but to go to a place is only an hour away by plane and to be in the midst of people to speak the language, you know what I mean? And it's through coming to Toronto, I became a, 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 a vegan, you know, my, my photography skills got better. You taught me a whole lot. Cause I remember meeting you going to your studio for the first time when you photographed me, I was exhausted and you wanted to make that photograph of me and I gave it to you. I remember that so well, cause I didn't want to do it, but I ended up, then I remember Jelani came and he was doing some, put some glasses on me, uh, you know, and through you, I looked at computer for the first time, you know what I mean? Because prior, I mean, I had, I had a, 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 a laptop, but now I'm looking at you with your two giant computer screens. And you had a, I was blown away with that, brother, because believe it or not, I had never been in a photography studio before. Your studio was the very first space ever in a professional studio. And when I was utterly blown away with the tour that you gave me, and you were so humble, because I remember the first photograph I gave you. I looked at it, there was a slight imperfection, and I gave you, I said, no, nah, no, nah, you can't have this here. I felt embarrassed. Here you are, you know, you're cleaning up images, and you you insisted on taking that photograph and, and I, I used to really feel bad for her. I said just like you felt when I saw your work on the walls I sure. felt this is it first of all this is in a book because you have this imperfection but you humbly took it and it meant the world to you and that told me a lot about you at that point in time I have everything that you've ever passed to me if you were to start today because of all the resources that photographers have today and all the limitations that you and I had when we started. When I watched you shoot in that workshop, you're like, yo, Cardi, one shot, one kill, one shot. That's all we got. I've used that term, one shot, one kill, this way. I've said this, you're not Jamil Shabazz. You can't one shot, one kill. You need to shoot hundreds of pictures to get that perfect shot. There's only one cat that I know that can one shot, one kill. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about one shot, one kill, and and why I know about it and how you related it well, to me. Well, even that, that was an idea that I had early on in my career when I I first started out even when I was 15 years old when I didn't have a lot of money to buy film but every image had to count because it was a lot of money back then so early on in, in my life you know with the Kodak Instamatic every photograph had to count so before I pressed that shutter I made sure that my light my composition everything was right my breath control trigger squeeze was all correct because it had to count so I started off doing that when I was 15 and when I came home from the military I didn't have a lot of funds so every image had to count and I think it's funny because I look at my contact sheets now. I can't believe I even did that because there wasn't no bracketing. It had to be right the first time. Now having a light meter, I just can't believe I did because there was, there was possibilities for mistakes. Because if I'm making an image of a person and he blinks, I look at the photographs and, and I miss it. I only took one frame. So in the beginning, I did it and I was able to calculate my time and right, make sure the person didn't blink and didn't move. But I have to be honest with you, as time progressed, that was no longer my practice. I might've did two frames, but I went from doing the one to just advance it because there is a chance that person can blink and you may not get it right. But, you know, as a military man, you're taught that idea of one shot, one kill. You know what I mean? Trigger squeeze, breath control to make sure that you get it right. You may not get that second chance. I actually took that from my, my time in the military and incorporated into my photography practices. And even to this day, when I shoot digital, I still shoot it like film. I don't, I might look at it, I only got 36 frames. So I'm not going to just do a lot of rapid firing to get the image. I know what I want. I've done photo shoots. Like when I shot Alicia Keys in Swiss Space, it was so funny because I knocked it out in like 20 minutes and they were shocked that they came in the way and I wanted a lot of research. You know, I I, 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 I recon my area. I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew how the light was going to fall. I knew the poses in which I want to do. I made a whole list of what I wanted. So when I photographed them, we were done in like 30 minutes. They looked at their watch like, we 
And that's that's my situation in most photo shoots I've done. I know exactly what I want. I don't need to get a lot. I might even, I, I remember I did something for the Cosmos and I photographed the crew in the subway and the first frame said, we could go home now. I knew that we had that shot and they were stunned because they had planned on being out there all day. But when I posed the subjects, created that shot, everybody in the team knew that we could go home. And I've done a number of shoots because I know exactly what I want. I'm going to position people properly. I've already practiced it. I already have the idea in my head and I know what I want. So it's still a practice that I do now, but I shoot a little bit more frames just to have fun and just show a variation. But in the early days, I said from the, from the, from the 80s on to the 90s, it was really that one frame. And I still can't believe it because I said the context sheet or the proof of it. I just participated in a new book project and exhibition called Contact High, which focuses on the context sheet of the photographers to look at those imperfections. And it's funny when I look at mine because in so many cases, it's just one portrait of one individual and it, it kind of like shows you my pattern. So that's the practice I did then. Today, with all honesty, I might shoot about five frames and I got it. So I don't do that anymore. And I remember Tony Barboza, who I have a lot of respect for. I did that practice and when I did a group shot of, of the Kamungay members and I just took the one shot and I knew I got it. And I said, I could go. he said, no, 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 no. Take another one just in case. Cause I photographed in there like 15 people and out of the 15, one could have Linked, but I was able to press and get it that first frame, even though I did take two more just in case, just to honor what he said. But in most cases, I know what I want. It's all about that timing, making sure everybody's on the same page. And because I love group shots and I've been photographing group for years now. And in most cases, it might just be two frames. And, 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 I, and I get it because it's all about that timing to let them know, are you ready? Showtime, click, everybody, this is the shot right now. And I get it, so. That's amazing, again, amazing. amazing. No, and I don't, I don't I don't tell anybody to do it, to be honest with you. That's something I did, because I was going through struggle, but in this age of digital photography, you don't have to focus on the one shot. I tell people, you know, get multiples, get different variations, go, don't go don't go that practice. A lot of people tried it and it didn't work, so don't blame me, get that one image, <laughs> you really get a great shot, and you decide just that one shot doesn't work. I do not recommend anybody does that. That's something I when I was going through all the time, I might do a minimum, a minimum of five and a maximum of maybe 20. So let me stop you there. Imagine now you're transitioning from film to digital and you you said like you kept and you keep that same discipline that you had when you shot film when you shot digital and in shooting digital. And that is why your work is so special that's why your work is so magic the fact that you held on to the fundamental that you learned from your father the fundamentals that you've learned about composition about decisive moment about trigger discipline about all of those things you apply it to your photography today now i know when you're shooting alicia keys for her album they have a budget they have a time there's makeup hair there's people there's dresses all that stuff and they're not used to that i'm sure they're not used to someone shooting 10 frames that i'm sure causes a certain anxiety what's your take on how your clients have handled working the way that you work. It's all about the client for me. I want to know what does the client want first. When I sit down and we meet, I want to know exactly what you want. I'm going to give you everything that you want. Uh, and that's that's key. It's not about what I want. It's what you want first. And then I'm going to break down on what I can do. And in most cases, I'm very fortunate with all of the various campaigns and what I've done. We have the monitor. So once I make images, it's the funniest thing too, because, and it, I guess it comes with confidence and having a sense of the vision, because once we go to the monitor within the first maybe 15 minutes the shot is there and the client is looking at it it's like wow that's the image you know like when i did that magazine for a swiss beast and alicia keys it was funny because i already had it this is what i do too a brother that people don't really know about and i request this in all of my photo shoots i have standing models that i rehearse with first so that's the practice of mine in every photo shoot that i've done with uh with puma i said i need some models to show my client what i'm going to do so i do a, i do an actual walkthrough of every situation wow. exactly what i'm create using models wow. in a stack way and now you look at what i got and you can make the corrections then and then i'll go on to do the actual shoot like even with swiss speed and alicia keys my mind is blown you book an entire shoot rehearse do the entire shoot the client gets that they can make all the notes on the smallest details and then when the real talent comes in you're just and then the yeah. next thing, did I hear that Jamil Shabazz shoots third? Is that what I just oh, yeah. heard when you're shooting with the client and you have, is that, 
happening? Are you kidding me? That street photographer that does one shot, one kill, that doesn't use technology, that's not about computers or all that stuff. You shoot, there's a monitor clients get to see. Let's go. There's a budget now. So I can get a crew. I want to employ people. I, I sent the photos just by myself. There's a point when I did the Cosmos, I had no assistant. And I look at it now like, I can't believe I did this by myself. I'm rolling with the client and the crew. I couldn't even get anybody to carry my camera bag. So I was accustomed to pretty much operating that throughout my career. So as time started to progress and I worked with Puma, they gave me, it had a nice budget where I was able to get me a, a dream team of young people I put in the wing to get guidance. So I had, the, you know, I had everything tethered so they could see it. And to me, it was a joy to look at it in real time right now and to see the expression on the client's face when I created these situations. So I absolutely loved it. The golf hall of Harlem was a lot of pressure because I only had about maybe 15 minutes with Gene Carlos Esposito, Forrest Whitaker. It was difficult and I had to get it in in a short amount of time. But again, I had my walkthroughs. I had all of my, my, my standing show each, all the clients exactly what I was going to do on the monitor and they made the corrections and it pretty much worked. So that's been a practice of mine forever because I want clients to see what I can do before I actually get the main subject. This is this is my vision because they put the ball in my court. In most cases, people hire me because of my sickness and style. But if you can give me examples of what you want, I please you first and I'll do my thing. You know what I mean? So that's very important to me so you, you can see it on the monitor. So, you know, in everything I do now, the monitor is there so the client can just see if we can make the, all the corrections. And it's always worked in my favor. But at the same time, you know, it cuts things down because I understand the idea of the budget and stressing things out because the way that, you know, the way the payment scale is. But I still make fun for because I have a tradition to I'll share with you. I'm in the photograph and everybody on, on, on deck and that means a lot to me. So once I finish shooting the subjects, everybody, everybody You shoot the crew. Right? Yeah, that's super genius. I, very, very smart. smart. Very smart. I want to give every single person I'm doing portraits to make it fun and that helps to build the relationships. Of, and it's probably making it fun for everybody too. And I want to honor everybody on deck. The caterers, everybody there, the janitors, everybody gets loves for me. You know, I've never really had a problem with that. The client appreciates the fact that I, I recognize everybody, the drivers, everybody is equally important to me. So that's, that's just a thing. Because I've incorporated, I never learned from anybody because it's not like, you're the only person I'd be really watching in the studio. But other than that, I had to figure this thing out on my own, how to move forward. And I wanted it to be one. There was never any mentor. I studied the work of Gordon Parks and he gave me the foundation of what I'm doing right now. He set the blueprint in terms of to, to do documentary, fine art, fashion, street photography, everything Gordon did want to do. My father died in, in 92, so I never had anybody to, to guide me in this particular endeavor. So I had to figure it out on my own and make it work. I'll say for the most part, it did work. Because in many cases, the client gives me my leeway to do what I do, because they know this is my style. So they don't, they don't try to really interject any ideas. They let me just flow and do what I do. I love it, Jamil. I've learned so much from the process as far as the double walkthrough. That is genius and is something that on shoots that the client has budget when there's real budget it's really genius also proud of you for adopting technology the way that you have adopting technology i know that i was one of the first to show you photoshop digital photography how how like just quick manipulations quick skin fixes i want you to know that i acknowledge as a man who's older than me it's hard to progress as a creative it's hard to evolve as an artist i've seen you as a creator i've seen you as a photographer i've seen you as a mentor and as a teacher evolve in a way that has been really jamal like so beautiful seeing your work in advertising and you remember i told you back then when we exhibited that everybody's going to know your name. Do you remember when I said you're going to be paid tens of thousands of dollars to do advertising? There's going to come a time when people will know that you are the root of this style. And now's the time. The kids are dying for originality. When people are seeing fantasy and over-processed and over-photoshopped work, people always gravitate back to the truth and reality. And you've always spoken the truth in your work you've always given love and light to people who look like you to people from all different ethnic backgrounds i've never seen a man who is literally so colorblind with 
their photographs. I feel like I know you because I know a little bit of your backstory. When you look through the camera, you really are a mirror for what's happened within your eyes from your time within corrections how you turned that into an opportunity to your time when you were literally first inspired to pay it forward and teach and do a workshop it seems that everything that you do you do it at the highest level i'm so happy that you took some time to talk with us today i'm wondering if there is a piece of advice that you could give to a young photographer the young photographer who's watching this right now and he shoots street or she shoots street and they're they're wondering how do they get to the point where people know their name like how people know ours. I, I think the key is to, there's the main saying that passion for the craft, carry your camera everywhere you go. Understand the importance of themes because it's, it's very good to have concrete themes in your mind. I have a number that I have that I focus on and it's almost like investments. It may not work right now, but as time goes on, it will. The foundation of my work is rooted in love. So love is the theme that I've been dealing with for a long time. Love and friendship. You know, then there's another body of work that I focus on the spot by my father, the theme of the document of the subways, which I was able to build up a body of your work. So it's important to build the bodies of work. It's important to enter contests. It's important to exhibit your work because through the exhibition of your works, you get great exposure and you meet other people and you're in a consistent network. It's important to find the photographer whose work that you admire and study his path and how he did it. Even though you're going to do it in your own way, it's good to have an example. I owe so much of my success today for the path that Gordon Parks laid for me. Being that he was one of the first black photographers to do it in the manner which he did, I wanted to understand it. And it's when I started to look at his work and read his, his, his read his writings it gave me a better understanding of how i need to move forward but it's important to support other artists at the same time too to network to go out to the gallery shows you know to use social media as a platform to gain great exposure you know i got turned on to social media kind of like late in the game with instagram but once i discovered it i became a curator of my own images and now every day i could curate shows and share my work to the to the larger world and you know because photography as art is a global language and you can reach out to so many people People. So don't be afraid to use social media to gain great exposure. Understand the significance of hashtag because you would never know who's watching you. Through my Instagram feed, I was able to get a number of jobs. Even my job with a Puma came because they were following me on Instagram and said, this is the work that we want. So be mindful of the things that you post because you never know who's paying attention. And contests are key. I didn't start entering contests until maybe 2000. When I, I entered four contests out of the four, I won three. And I just happened to enter them because I thought that my work was good and it worked. But you you never know where it's going to go. In New York, we have an organization called Photoville. They take submissions about two, three times a year into work for Photoville, you know, and I, I, I've been with them for 10 years now. And within the 10 years, I've been able to, to, to submit seven major ideas to them that turned into exhibits and curation opportunities. So you want to be involved in all of it. You want to strengthen your relationship with a lot of photographers and get mentorship if possible. It's, it's very important to have some kind of like guide you along the way. Again, nobody did it for me. I had to figure it out on my own. So I'm dedicated now that helped develop in the careers of photography. One of the most important shows I curated was called Positivity, where I met a number of young people throughout my international travel who never exhibited before. And they just never showed. And I gave all, I took all the information down. And when the opportunity came for me to curate the show, I involved them all in that show to give them their wings. So that's Amazing. what I, I believe in helping people get started. But the, the key is to be focused and try to go against the grain and do things that other people have not done. Having a concrete theme, it makes all the difference in the world. Because a lot of work looks the same today. Unlike when I first started, you know, there wasn't a lot of photographers around. If you saw a person with a box with a camera, he was either a professional photographer or a tourist. Today, everyone has the ability to make a niche either by digital photography, a cell phone. It's never been a popular hobby like it is today, as we see on Instagram. There's a lot of great talent out there. But how do you compete in this very competitive time? And it's challenging, but you got to go against the grain, do something that's never been done before, or at least do it in a very unique way. Learn how to speak about your work. For me, it's not about being a photographer. I look at myself more of being an alchemist. I have the ability to freeze time and motion. And that's a lesson to be in your situation and freeze that moment and then throw it out 20, 30 years later. You know, so that's what I do. And I see myself more so that I don't even like to use the term photographer. I'm a visual story storyteller. That's what I do right now. And it, it wasn't, it, it, it was unbeknownst to me when I first started out, but it means so much today. Like I would have never imagined 20, 30 years ago. Cause why? Cause due to platform Instagram, 
right. I'm posting a photograph of people I took 30, 40 years ago. And Steve, the stories that are coming out of it are unbelievable. People are now reaching out to me saying, that's me. I think the biggest mistake that I made throughout my life is using the word I, you know? Mm. I don't like that, you know what I mean? I don't want to ever, it's just something about that it seems self you know. So I, I strive to the best of my ability to stay away from using that word because, you know, it's, it's not good, you know? I don't want to ever appear arrogant. Cause again, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And I think in the past, in my not understanding it early on and being in front of people, you know, like even when I did the participated in the document, everybody straight, it was all new to me. I didn't understand this right now. I didn't, I didn't really know how to speak about my work, you know? And now when I, in retrospect, when I look at it, I'm one of many, you know, people look at my work and my style and think that I was one of the first to do it, but there's a lot of other people that have done it. They just didn't get the opportunity. So I, I stand on the shoulders of a whole lot of people. There's a lot of individuals have not gotten it due. So I just look at myself in retrospect, I would never speak in terms like this is something, what I'm doing is something unique that has not been done before. I have my own particular style, but I don't, I don't ever want to appear arrogant. It's something about, again, the word I, thinking that I have something that's really unique in a sense. It's, it's just my personal experience. So again, I would, I would limit the word, the usage of the word I focus more on us and we. I love that. I love that. Do you believe in 2023 it's possible for somebody to start making a living with just creativity in 2023? I'm very honest with you. It's very challenging. You know, as you know, I started out in the 70s and I didn't really start to make gain traction until 2001 at the age of 40, 41 years old. It took me a long time to navigate and figure this thing out. Now I have a foundation. I've been retired from corrections for 20 years. I had a day job that gave me foundation, health benefits, you know, and a pension. I get a, I get a steady paycheck every month. So I'm able to survive and make this a living. For a lot of young people, you know, trying to navigate in that manner, they are faced with a lot of hardships. I have a lot of friends now that watch me and didn't really understand my backstory. They're struggling every day. They gotta get out there every day and make in images. And this is a challenge for them because if they don't get those images, they're not gonna eat. So I'll tell people that you gotta have a foundation first. Consider a day job to supplement your income so you can move forward because it's not easy. It's gotten easy for me right now because like I said, I develop an even broader strategy because I sell, my work goes into institutions. I do a lot of exhibitions. I'm selling portfolios. I license out images because I have product that a lot of people don't have. Most of the images that I license are based off the 1980s for a lot of documentary films that come out. But I have a body of work. And go If you just starting out, you'll start out again in a very competitive view. But I will tell young photographers starting out, this is what you might want to consider doing. I believe and diversify. I do a number of things. I do a talk books. I'm striving now to do a book a year. I, I make sure I'm in both group ex important ex I really no longer focus on galleries, but I focus on museums and institutions of higher learning. I proposition organizations to purchase my portfolios. I sell prints. I lecture of that word I. Let me get away from that. It's important for me to, to curate now. So the playing field is wide for me. So I'm doing a little bit of everything. So if one thing is not working, this other thing is working. But there's always a steady flow of any income coming in because I have so many products. With all these documentary films that come about, especially with the 50th anniversary of hip hop, it's never been a better time for me because I'm participating in book collaborations and exhibitions. So for a new person starting out, you got to hustle hard. You have to build up an incredible body of work. You got to not only don't wait for opportunities to come your way, go out there and create opportunities. Like I shared with you before, when people were knocking on my door, I went out there, I created fashion shoots on my own. I got models, had aspirations to be models, and I photographed them. I'm constantly looking to develop ideas that serve as an investment down the road. So, you know, even in, in participating exhibitions is not guaranteed your work is going to sell, but you got to be in it to win it. So you just have to be versatile in your craft and don't be limited. I know people just focus on just one thing, just street photography. Check out street, do fashion, do documentary, do fine art, be versatile. So when those contests come and they're looking for work on fine art, you have that. Whenever the call comes to me, I can have whatever you want. And if I don't have it, I can go out there and make that in. So always be prepared, be organized, because you never know when those opportunities come. Especially with a lot of these publications, if they have contests, that's on a regular. I, I've met people, I try to put people with shows on father, on fatherhood. He said, well, I don't have anything on fathers. Look, I'm giving you an opportunity to be in a major show. If you don't have anything on fathers, you need to go out there and do it. Something. Yeah, shoot you, something. You show to give you foundation and you need all foundation you get as a young photographer. You need to be in the show, the group shows, the solo shows. You got, you got to, you got to do it all. You got to have people recognize your work and submit the interviews. So you, you have to make yourself. And that's what I did. You know, I, I made it a point to just look at, I'm a chess player. I looked at all the pieces 
with my board and everything had to work for me. So if this thing is not working, that's not gonna, you know, I wanna make this thing work. And at the same time, follow people and like they work, you know, cause you never know how, how that makes a difference in a person's life where they that's might beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. You're the second person who said that. When I interviewed Fiona Lart, she said one of the things that she does is every single person, and there's thousands that like her photos, she goes to all of their accounts. If they're a photographer, she looks at their work and she tries to say a nice compliment about every single person who takes the time to look at their work. And you're saying that you do that same thing as well. So everybody who's watching, that's definitely something that your kind words to somebody about their photography on that right day could make more of a difference than you could possibly imagine for sure. That's amazing. And thank you for sharing that. Jamil, what's your thoughts on the future of photography? I'm, I'm blown away with just the cell phone capability, the power of the cell phone. I mean, I'm blown away with, you know, the fact movies, you could do things. Full time. It's amazing to me. And I, I'm embracing, I, I cherish it. I'm still believe, believe in tradition, but I love the yeah. Everyone has the ability to image like never before. And I've never seen a time period where there's such a profound love for image making like it is today. So sure. I, I still love it. I embrace it. I'm striving to learn as much as I can, but I'm still learning. You know, I, you know, despite the success that I had throughout my life, there's still so much for me to learn. To this day, I've never used Photoshop. I, mean, I, I understand it, but I've never used it anything. I, I haven't embraced a lot of the technology that's in front of me. You know, I, I'm a traditionalist. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm still learning. I think that the future, I don't even, I can't even say right now, but I know it's going to be great because it's constantly elevated, even with, with AI. You know, I've been looking forward to embracing that part of my creative process because I look at a lot of things that can do. You know, so sky's the limit. What's your opinion? Because you, you won this on the front lines to this endeavor. I'm just curious on how you see, you know, the future of photography. My take is photography is not going anywhere. It's been here since 1839. It's not going anywhere. Us as creators, we are the architects. And the way the word that you used is we're the alchemists. We are the alchemists of creativity. We can see. For the people who can see and capture and document, whether you can write or whether you can sing or whether you can paint for creatives there's always a place for us do you think photography heals i believe that photography heals the photographer who's making the photos and the viewer who's seeing the photographs if there's a subject that's in the photograph i also believe that the act of capturing a subject is healing for the subject in terms of how photography helped me heal of course i started to get really deep into my photography during my my really my 20 years in corrections because I was dealing with an extremely violent, hostile environment every single day. You can't imagine what a jail was like, especially during the, the crack epidemic. I was going into an institution with a high level of violence, sometimes working 16 hours a day. Wow. So when you deal with that situation and violence and hatred, for me to leave the job, I would have to go out photograph, to find hope, to find love, find joy, to balance all of that out. A lot of my coworkers would fall victim to alcohol alcoholism or, or addiction because they had to deal with the trauma, the PTSD of seeing so much violence every day. For me, it was the photography. It was able to approach people and let a lot of young people know what it is I just finished experiencing and why this photograph is important for me. And then in making these images, I would bring my portfolios into the gym and help a lot of the young men who were going through difficult times and use that visual language of photography to help them see the beauty of life and to see freedom. Because a lot of these young men that I had, they were doing 20, 30 years. So my photographs, they saw, they saw life. But it has helped me tremendously because I survived so much. Even to this day, it's, it's very painful to go back into time. You know, it's very traumatizing because I've lost a lot of people within my life. Between 2018 and now, I've lost over 90 people. And the 90 people who I've lost, I photograph. So my photographs often come up on social media that this person died. And, and that's very troubling. So I'm battling every day with this healing process. But this photography is not purpose you know because with, with the way the world is that i'm not happy with the world is believing i'm paying with all the violence that is being uploaded in real time i've never seen so much hatred in my life it's one thing back in the days to go through the books like national geographic Ape magazine and just studying war photography books but today i'm seeing so much in real time that has traumatized me over and over again so what motivates me is to get my work out there to the universe to do exhibitions it gives me a sense of purpose and it helps me to heal when i take all these images that i've been able to 
to freeze and get it out and share it to a larger universe. That gives me a sense of balance and purpose because there's times in my life that I feel like I'm not worthy, that I'm not doing enough. But when I'm able to get the work out, it helps, it helps me to heal and it helps other people to heal. But it's deeper than what anyone could ever imagine. The stories are utterly incredible. And I have letters that people written me that are just so profound in regards to what my images means, means to them. Like what I'm doing now, which is very interesting, a lot of young men have reached out to me on Instagram because I photographed their fathers who they never met wow. as their mother's wounds. And what's amazing about it is that these sons look just like their fathers fathers in cases i'm the only one that has photographs of their fathers so it brings me great joy to pass on the photographs and share a little bit of history with them about who their father was to me and what this image means but it helps them there's this just so many situations but i mean the bad stories are just incredible and so even people who were once violent well it's, it, it's it, that can get kind of emotional i can't really go there you might look at a photograph and see somebody that you did harm to oh, and now wow. it makes you reflect as you thumbed them up, because I've heard stories in Barnes and Noble when my book back in days first came out, the people told me in management when I would go there to sign copies that grown men were in here crying. I hear that over and over and over again. And this is a part of the healing process too, in light of the crack and AIDS epidemic where a lot of people were lost in the photograph. Because when I look at my work, it's a time before crack. So in so many cases, I photograph every at their prime. Now you're looking at yourself at your best. There's family members that wrote me and say, that's my aunt right there before she fell victim the crack. Look how beautiful she is. And what I try to do with my book of time before crack is to remind people how they were before the crack epidemic hit. To remind those that fell victim to selling drugs. Look at how you were before crack, before you fell victim to this lifestyle. So it's helping a lot of people heal it's a lot of children better understand their parents and how they live. You know, so there's a lot of variations of the healing of power of photography on so many different levels. But for me, like I said, it helps me to understand I had a purpose in life. Because like I said, there's times in which I, I, it goes through my mind every day that I feel like I'm not doing enough in this world. But when I look at my work and what I'm able to do, when people write me and say that your, your photograph made my heart sing. Hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm writing you from Australia. I want you to know that your work means a lot to me and it helped me to understand my purpose. So it's helping me heal and battle some of the internal demons I have by knowing that I'm able to bring some joy in the world because every day is a battle for me, bro. You know, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not struggling with trying to navigate through life and navigating through all the, 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 the hatred that I'm seeing every day. So if I could post a picture on my Instagram feed, a song to make somebody reflect, it's helping me heal at the same time. It brings me great joy. I told my wife earlier, if it wasn't for my post, I don't know where I would be at right now because I wake up with a determination to take an idea that's in my mind and bring it out to the universe. It could be an image, a video of a sunset or a sunrise, but I need to get it out and share it to the universe in hopes that that seed will, will, will plant some type of positivity within a person's heart and bring a little bit of joy in this world and touch somebody in some way. That's so beautiful. Jamil, I gotta thank you for spending some so much time with me. Is there anything that you would like to say if someone came to this video and they were looking for a piece of inspiration, what would you tell them today? We as visionaries have been given a divine gift. You know, rather you be a poet, a photographer, a painter, a writer, we need all hands on deck right now to, as visionaries, to make the world a better place. And I really believe that it's the art community that has that power to do it. We have to take some time and meditate on our purpose in life. What do we want our life? How do we want to remember it as life goes on? And then looking at all the things that wrong, that's going wrong in society, let us take on these individual battles. It could be pollution, global warming, violence, drug addiction. As visionaries, we can use our gift to make this world a better place. I am saddened by all the things which I'm seeing. We have to produce a balance right now because whatever reason, the negativity is being promoted. The fights are being promoted. I never remember a time when people are getting engaged in fighting and nobody wants to break it up. They just want to videotape it. We as conscious artists have to serve as a counter narrative to a lie of the negativity. We have to end and make an assessment of everything that's going on right now. 
We have a war going on in Ukraine. It's world poverty. It's pollution. There's so many problems going on in the world. Artists have the ability to make a difference. The same energy it takes to create an image that doesn't really say anything, you could take that same energy to create an image that says something. If there's something, like I said, that troubles you with inside your heart, let's talk about it. It doesn't necessarily have to be making a piece of art about it, but let's have conversations. We have to make this world a better place because we're in trouble with everything that's going around the world right now. We have all these mass shootings that are taking place here in North America. Violence is at an all-time high. We live in a state of lawlessness. Drug addiction is at a high right now. There's a lot of pain and suffering. We can make a difference. Start with ourselves first by asking the question, what is my purpose in life? And what can I do to make this world a better place? I ask myself that question every single day and I, I have an understanding of it. And I just strive to help other people say that we need you right now. We need all hands on deck because it's just, I've just never seen a time where it's just so much hatred out there, like never before. And it's being promoted through social media. You know, a lot of misconception. I mean, there's this ignorant behavior. People have, 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 we have been dumbed down as a society where a lot of us have fallen victim to pranks and berating each other. How can conscious artists say we need to make change we need to come together we need to come together as artists and create what provoking uh, exhibitions that uh, showcase hope and possibility i've learned uh, from wed the bulls back in 1900 when he came with the negro exhibition where he brought positive images of african americans to france during the paris exhibition to give a counter narrative of all the stereotypical images that were being shown and it made a big difference during that time because during the 1900s especially when world war one hit a lot of the african american servicemen the served in France, they were treated with open arms. Even a lot of the uh, black actors and musicians, they were able to go to France. Why? Because that barrier was broken down due to that art exhibition. It showed positive images. We have to balance out the negative. Too much attention is given to negativity right now, and it's very troubling to see. If you look on TikTok and various other social media feeds, negativity is being promoted out there. We need, we need artists, or should I say visionaries, to come forward and just address what's close to your heart. You know, because I'm doing the best I can, but we need so many people right now to speak out against the hatred you know speak out against the violence we all can make a difference if i repeat in my life i live for it.